Welcome to all of you. Thank you for your patience, as we always are working on technology, but we're trying to learn quickly these days. Um, with, my name is Shannon Kirshner. I'm the pastor here at Fourth Church, and I have been honored to be able to be Walt and Darlene's pastor for how many years? Eight? No, ten. Yeah, well, I've been here eight, so we'll go with that. <laughs> When Walter first asked me to write um, a preface for this lovely book, I actually admit that I felt like a bit like an imposter. Because as you all know much too well, I am a word person. Lots of words. Words make up my life. I'm not necessarily an art person. I actually got C in art in third grade. And so that pretty much ruined it for forever. But I also know that words can be used to um, crowd out silence, they can be used to link things of mystery, they can be used to overpower and overwhelm any kind of sense of contemplation. And so those dangers are why I'm very thankful for this provocative study of noticing where the divine presence interacts with modern art. I realize in that very act of writing this preface how I'm drawn to the honesty and the candor that you can find in the modern art we as Walter reflects himself in his foreword, there's the pieces that take your breath away by their starkness, and their sense of loneliness and gloom. In the modern wing, I always get this sense that a few of those artists, very few, pay any attention to the pressure of making things nice or palatable. Rather, they sculpt or paint exactly what they think. They don't employ much pretense. And I find that honesty, that candor of modern art to be refreshing. And it hit me that there's not such a difference at all between the worlds of faith and artistic creations like are found in the modern wing. Faith, like modern art, calls us to be creators of beauty and holders of mystery, as well as to be honest about the myriad of ways that we continue to fall short. The God in whom we believe does not expect us to bifurcate our mind from our heart, or from our beliefs, nor our hearts from the pain and the mystery of the world. So as I end the piece that I wrote, we don't have to actually choose between this church on Michigan Avenue and the modern wing on the other side of the river. We can function as conversation partners together on the journey. So welcome to that conversation here today, and let us pray. Gracious God, we are indeed grateful for the way that you continue to shape us in this often chaotic world. So we pray for this time together that we will have our eyes opened to the beauty of your mystery, to the beauty of art which expresses what words can fair, rarely convey. Give to us a sense of your presence and your courage. Amen. Dr. Hanson. Thank you, Shannon. When you read the book, please read the first word of the book, the foreword, which Shannon quoted from the very end, because that is the beginning, and it sets the stage for the rest of the book. And the uh, sentence she just read is followed by this, faith like modern art also calls us to be creatures, creators of beauty and holders of mystery. We said in part of the communion service, great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And great is the mystery of modern art as well. Great is the protest of modern <laughs> art. It's part of modern art to be disruptive and upsetting. Yeah, that's the layout. That's your, that's your chapter. Yeah, I just thought of that as you pointed to yourself. It's <laughs> disruptive. Yes. Subversive. Let's just pause and listen to that music. The drums. Shannon, before she, before you preached, you said, listen to the living word of God. In person, we listen to you many times on screen. There's, there's so often that sense of 
hearing another voice beyond, above, through you as you preach and calm my heart, my eyes sting. When I go to the modern wing from here, as Darlene and I often did after church, we have lunch and church with piano, and then go down and slowly, slowly go through part of the modern wing. You can't move fast, otherwise you miss so much. I go and listen to try to understand. And this is my all-time favorite image in the modern wing. Alberto Giacometti went to Paris as a 21-year-old in 1922, and he had all the greats, Rodin, and so many others to look at, but this is the kind of image he sculpted. He cast many of these images in bronze, this one in bronze, six foot tall image. But he loved primarily to work in wet clay, which is wet dust. He loved to scrape, cut, and scratch, pinch until it almost vanished, almost became nothing. And that was his purpose, to show the frailty, show the vulnerability of life, human existence as we experience it. I stood there thinking, listening, and I began to hear another voice as I listened, a whisper of God whisper thin voice. You are dust. You are dust. And it's a humble word to hear. You are dust. And yet I hear at the same time another word. And I breathe into you the breath of life. The walking man is not weak, not empty. He's unstoppable. He's moving forward. He's walking. He's on a mission. And so I, that's the first word I hear, the first whisper I hear in the modern way. You are dust. And I breathe into you in the breath of life. And I sent you on a mission. Summarizing that, putting into a short synopsis many conversations next to this walking man. And then I hear, and I am with you. And then I think, this walking man is the walking Jesus. He became flesh, he dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. That's what we celebrate. The incarnation of divine love. I am here. I am with you. And I give you the strength to love. And so I hear the word from this walking man follow me. And I stand next to this walking man and I want to follow him and walk with him. This is another museum in the National Gallery. I look for walking men all over the place. <laughs> It's actually made quite a few. You can find them in many places. So I'm there showing my resolve, my commitment. I hear his voice follow me. And then I hear in subsequent conversations. You know, here, we come here to have conversation with God. I mean, the hymns are prayers, right? Come, come Emmanuel, we started with. All the way through, we let him pray. And then we come to listen. But the conversation doesn't stop here. It continues wherever we are. And I find the modern way to be a place where the conversation with God is stimulated, inspired, provoked. And so I hear another voice, and that is I'm lonely. I'm dust. I'm weak. I need you. Because we just heard as the close of this service, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering. 
So that's the call of this walking man as well. And I who heard the voice of Jesus now say to this walking man, homeless, a refugee, stricken with this illness, I say, I'm here. I'm here. Now I've condensed years of standing next to the walking man. It takes a long time to hear. And I think that's part of what we try to do in this book is take time to listen to these images. I always gather my grandsons around the walking man. And I always say, what do you see? And what do you hear standing next to the walking man? Fortunately, I have an artist wife who walks with me. Much of what I've learned is with her, through her, beside her. I personally have good friends who are artists, the contributors to this book, who will share this morning in the interviews. Fortunately, I have a co-editor, a co-pilot, a guide, a teacher, a mentor, who doesn't look good. He's seven years younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have had such a journey together for Seven years. Oh, well, it doesn't Six years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Seven years. Much longer. Yeah. yeah, well, we've had a longer journey than this project. And fortunately, this church, uh, you adult education committee, specifically, and the whole church, have provided the kind of hospitality, the kind of generous welcome to this project, this venture, that it needed to happen. It wouldn't have happened without you. So I, I want to stand here and say thank you for the Presbyterian Church. We made it happen. And uh, it's been a great journey together with you. Well, that's my part. That was a bit of false advertising that Walter will teach. I just wanted to start the ball rolling here. And now we're going to have others uh, who are contributors to the book share it. And can my co-pilot, guide, and teacher, so, no, no teaching, just preaching this morning, right? <laughs> this uh, project started in 2015, November of 2015, and we had four lectures here. This was Walter's idea entirely, and then he said, hey, would you help me think about who it is we ought to listen to in November? So we had four lectures in 2015, November. Three more in 2016 of November, three more in 2017. And then after that, I think we started talking with David McNutt, who is one of our presenters, who'll be in this morning, and said, you know, maybe there's a book here. What if we would take these sort of informal presentations that we had over these um, three years and what if everyone would write a chapter and we would wrap it all up together and put it into this book? So we did that. So from the uh, beginning, from the, the starting line to finish, it's been about a six-year project and taking care of taking all kinds of curious turns. And so this is a kind of homecoming celebration for us this morning. Thanks for being here. So 11 of us participated, two theologians, two art historians, and the rest of us primarily studio artists. So. Um, this is an unchoreographed event this morning. The only thing holding it together is this humble PowerPoint that I've put together. And so five of us are going to stand and talk a little bit about what they've been learning um, since they wrote, did their lecture here a number of years ago, wrote their chapter, and what they've been thinking about since. Each of them has about two or three images. We're going to try to make good time through this. but. Um, Part of what I hope you'll witness as we all come up here and take our turns this morning is that um, all the contributors to this book, we all know one another, and many of us have known one another for a long time. But the book project, in a way, represents a kind of intellectual friendship between us, actually, and, and a kind of discursive conversation that we've all been part of, more or less, and it's just fun to see it come out in, in book form. So, Tim Lowley's coming up. I'm going to let each speaker say anything they want to about introducing themselves, but Tim, it's all yours. If you get stuck, I'll hit a button for you. Thank you. Good morning. I really appreciate 
case, um, mm -hmm. the works we guys built and put this project together. And um, so I'm going to just dive in here. I think this will be. I grew up in South Korea. Uh, my parents were medical missionaries. At that time, in the 60s, Korea was uh, still dealing with the Korean War. So I grew up surrounded by poverty and uh, destitution. Uh, we, my introduction to art was the World Book Encyclopedia, the painting section specifically. And the one painting I remember from that section is the painting you see on the screen. Uh, it's Pablo Picasso's painting of the old guitarist. And I, I, I start the chapter, the chapter I wrote for the book is a very strange chapter. Basically, you're following someone as they're meandering through the art museum and engaging different people in the conversation. And I start with this painting in part because to me it is kind of the heart of the modern collection. Um, I don't speak much about Picasso in general, but this particular painting uh, seems to be had, had been made in a point of life that was really uh, dark. Um, so that leads me to, to thinking about something else, and that is the story of the, the Good Samaritan. Jesus talking about the Good Samaritan. And that's a story I, I pondered for about five years every time I ran. This is about 10 years ago. And it led me to, to um, thinking about what is love? And coming out of that, it, I came to this conclusion that love is to deeply and empathetically engage the other towards giving the other agency. That is what love is. If you, if you listen carefully to that story, it's about empathetically and deeply engaging the other towards giving the other agency. Why did I talk about that? Well, imagine going to an art museum and attempting to engage the work with that same attitude of deeply and empathetically engaging the work towards what can that work do for me? Why am I saying this? This is in contrast to what people think of as Christian art. Most people think of Christian art as being pictures that illustrate their own belief. My belief is actually, when you approach any work of art as a Christian, you should be deeply and empathetically engaging that towards giving that agency that is meaning in the world. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thanks. Oh, the, in, the, in the book, the, the chapter, which is written anonymously, uh, there are sketches. <laughs> I was informed that we couldn't reproduce the paintings, so I made drawings of all the paintings under a pseudonym. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, something about this book, by the way, we'll mention it to you now. Um, we have free copies for all of you today of this book, so we'd love for you to leave with one or if you know someone else that you think would love to have you know, just please take them. It's uh, Walter's thank you and my thank you to you all. Um, I'd like to tell a little bit about this story you know, when we were uh, getting reproductions for a book like this and the 16 pages of colored plates in the middle, so it's just gorgeous, but it's very complicated and very expensive. And, I had to break the news to Tim that we, we couldn't get color reproductions for every piece in his chapter. And he said, well, I have an idea. What if I go and, and basically produce sketches of all the pieces I'm talking about and include those in the book? Then they're my drawings, and we don't have to pay anything. <laughs> and there are these beautiful red rings, and this is one of the, the drawings that, that Tim did. So it was great fun. Yeah. Well, the, the protest has already been mentioned, and to even engage modern art seriously today is to do so with this noise outside. That modernism and the attention and the reverence to objects and to paint seems to be a thing of the past, because the voices that you will hear when you enter the museum today sound like this. Many of you will know that Barbara Kruger has taken over, not the modern wing, but the main exhibition, temporary exhibition space in the Art Institute right now. 
And uh, Reverend Kirshner mentioned she prefers words. You will get lots of words. You'll get nothing but words when you go to a Barbara Kruger exhibition. You will get uh, hounded. You will get yelled at. You will get screamed at. Um, and because there are things in the world that need screaming. And so you will feel that, and it will be cacophonous, and it will be disturbing. And she knows you're going to take selfies, so she's set it up so that she can deconstruct your selfie as you take it. And it is a disturbing experience to enter into this, which I hope you have a chance to do. And for those of us uh, who have been around a while, like myself, we have a long relationship with Barbara Kruger exhibitions. And we've, we're used to this hounding. And I got tired of it, to be honest with you. I remember going to a Barbara Kruger exhibition at the Hershorn that was against consumerism, but the display table had to be moved in front of the Barbara Kruger exhibition to sell the catalogs connected. And I just thought, this is some point of absurdity. Because of all the places to issue a leveling critique against society, is high art innocent of those charges? And that's what you find the deeper, I should probably take my mask off. The deeper you go in to the recesses of contemporary art is they know that they are as complicit in the corruption and the hoarding and the insider trading as anything that they would hurl accusations against. So every thing, every accusation is always a boomerang that is coming back with great force toward the art museum itself. And I think Barbara Kruger and her advocates know that very well. And so when Cam asks, uh, what would you like to say looking back upon your chapter, that's the sadness. What I tried to do is I went into the Kruger exhibition and I did deconstructive uh, images that I put on Instagram. So when she says, I love myself and forgave me for it, which is the big message, I just took I love and cropped it and subversively put it on Instagram. Look, Barbara Kruger is telling us to love one another. Or she took some Bible verse and, and rips it out of context and makes Christianity deliberately look ridiculous. And I took that Bible verse and framed it and said, look, Barbara Kruger is saying, read your New Testament. Or um, she says, um, hope less. And I just took hope and posted that. So I was proud of myself for saying, OK, that's how you deconstruct the deconstructors. Um, but at the end of the day, I really was only sad because there is a staircase that you'll walk into and see this afternoon if you come with us that seems to be a perfect summation of what our culture is telling us. You're not sexy enough, not silly enough, not silent enough, not mean enough, not man enough, not hot enough, not petty enough, not stupid enough, not false enough, not true enough, not ironic enough, not skinny enough, not good enough. And that is all that she can offer us, and she offers it to us to the point of exhaustion. This is the staircase that every single person in this culture is attempting to surmount all the time, and there is no end to it. Once you climb to the top, there's only more steps waiting for you. And so the question that I ask myself is, what is the difference? Reverend Kirshner said, there is no difference. And in some senses, that's true. We need to not overplay um, the disjunction between what's going on there, where God is present, and what's going on here. But I think the difference is, is that we in the church have something that the art museum does not have. To make that point, what I would simply like to do is to juxtapose an image that I wrote about in this book upon these stairs. And I'm going to do so while reading a Reformation Day sermon, two paragraphs, just two, uh, from Nadia Bowles Weber, a Lutheran minister you may know. So it's a simple formula. I'll just read it twice so that we can get this message into our self-justifying hearts, mine in particular. You can tell the law because it is almost always an if-then proposition. If you follow all the rules in the Bible, then God will love you and you will be happy. If you lose 20 pounds, then you will be worthy to be loved. If you live a perfectly righteous, green, eco-lifestyle, 
then you will be worthy of taking up space in the planet. If you never had a racist or sexist or homophobic thought, then you will be worthy of calling other people out on their racism and sexism and homophobia. The law is always conditional and never anything anyone can do perfectly. When we treat law as if it will save us, as if it is gospel, there can never be flourishing. Under the law, there are only two options, pride and despair. When fulfilling the shoulds, the not enoughs, is the only thing that determines our worthiness. We are either prideful about our ability to follow the rules compared to others, or we despair at our inability to perfectly do anything. Either way, it's still bondage. And that's why the gospel is different. The gospel is not an if-then proposition. It's more Wizard of Oz than that. Remember, because, because, because. The gospel is a because, 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 because God is our creator, and because we rebel against the idea of being created beings and insist on trying to be God for ourselves, and because God will not play by our rules, and because in the fullness of time, when God had quite enough of all that, God became human in Jesus Christ to show us who God really is. And because God would not be deterred, God went so far as to hang from the cross we built and did not even lift a finger to condemn, but said, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. And because Jesus Christ defeated death and the grave and rose on the third day, and because we all sin and fall short and are forever turned in our, ourselves and forget that we belong to God and that none of our success guarantee this and none of our failures exclude this, and because God loves God's creation, God refuses for our sin and brokenness and inability to always do the right things to be the last word because God came to save and not to judge. Therefore, therefore, you are saved by grace as a gift and not by the works of the law and this truth will set you free like no self-help and no museum can do. I think that's what Shabal is after. If we went to the other staircase, we would see another message, and I think that piercing ray of light deconstructs the staircase once and for all.
to us this indeterminate and endlessly developing and endlessly forming uh, force uh, in our lives. So since writing that chapter, uh, Cam has asked us to reflect on with you on where we've gone since then. One of the subjects, other than portraiture, that Picasso attended to uh, as a cubist, and that his cubism, by the way, underwent many, many transformations itself. But in this phase, around 1910 or 1911, uh, was landscape. And landscape is a subject matter that I, as an artist, have been involved in, been involved with very uh, heavily for the last 10 years or so. And so I'm interested in the way that indeterminate figuration of being works its way out when we look at the landscape around us. And so uh, I've also then given you uh, an image of mine um, on the right, a recent landscape painting. And the thing that I recognize is that Picasso makes that indeterminacy very overt, very obvious. You can't help it. But if you do what I do and stand in front of the landscape and try to work with it, you realize that it doesn't matter how resolved you intend to be, you're never going to resolve it. It is completely irresolvable. It is constantly changing, moving, living, breathing. And the only thing I can assume then is that is because God is in it. And so for me, this reflection on cubism as it turns toward my own work, is just a kind of confirmation of that reality and an effort to constantly turn to and respect that in uh, the natural environment all around us and in other Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You get the feeling there might be a longer conversation about each of these Short little presentations, there absolutely is. Thanks, Joel. Linda, you're next. I feel like my job is really easy having the protest outside, and we're, we're, aren't we creating a thread here, um, a unifying theme? And I say that because the opportunity that Walter Hansen and Cam Anderson gave to us was to, as you've now learned, <coughs> was to take a work of art and to, as it were, invite others to do what we already enjoy doing, which is teasing out the theological resonance. Now, I don't know if you see theological resonance, and now that the protest is waning, that's almost too bad because I wanted it in the background. <laughs> I think you may be able to see what I mean when I say that my job is so easy. The, the task of how might this invitation to write a chapter, in my case, a chapter on Barnett Newman's radically minimalist Stations of the Cross, how might, how might we have in, uh, in recent months since the publication, the last two years since the uh, bringing together of the chapters, how might we have expanded our thinking? So you all are now looking at the, what I said, are the radically minimalist canvases, 14 canvases, yes, entitled Stations of the Cross, works that we would normally expect to see references to Christ's passion that we can recognize and yet deny that. And as I flip through, the reason I say my job is so easy is that it was in 2016, and not to overemphasize that year, but not to underemphasize it either. In 2016, I know I both got 
I, I work overseas in the fall. I live in Paris, France. And by the way, send all of your students to Asbury University's Paris semester program <laughs> every fall. <coughs> so I've just come home from there. But I woke up one morning and th there were some election results that were, uh, were surprising to some and um, encouraging to others. And since 2016, uh, you know, it's currently we're in, uh, of course, another national, um, no, I won't say crisis, how can I phrase this, conversation and challenge as to best enjoy our unity as American people in the face of other challenges. Uh, that, and today, of course, that being the pandemic. And I raised 2016 because it was in 2016 that here you're looking at the National Gallery of Art in DC. It was in 2016 that the National Gallery of Art, the People's Gallery, that's what their directors prefer to call it. It was in 2016 that our National Gallery of Art, funded by your tax dollars, made a really interesting decision to take this collection, Barnett Newman's 16, again, there it is, 16 pieces, Stations of the Cross, and to reinstall it from where the 16 pieces had been. If you've been there, you know perhaps that basement, the basement level wasn't the best level to appreciate the importance of these works. And in 2016, Harry Cooper led an initiative to reinstall them here in a newly renovated tower. The reason I, kind of come, I keep coming back to this slide is I really want you to notice that today one cannot visit the work of this very difficult, but I believe truth-telling artist without confronting our own nation's capital. I'm going to step away. Please notice, as you would enter, Barnett Newman's newly installed Stations of the Cross, what you would see. So we have the entrance, and this is what excited me, is after beginning the chapter and such, this was, this was what was happening. When I was going up to do my research and spending time in the archives, speaking with Harry Cooper, who was so excited about the reinstallation, I couldn't help as I snap that photo, I think there's something in this picture, there's something in this picture that lends poignancy to what you see when you walk through those doors. An invitation, an invitation to truth telling. Now we may not love this work. We may not choose to purchase it and place it in our living rooms, but I want us all all of us, when you have a chance to go to D.C. next time, spend time in this room and recognize the means by which very radically minimalist works, yes, these are unprimed, unprimed canvases created with simply masking tape and black house paint, but if you'll give them a chance, you'll see that arranged in a liturgical manner, and these are no any 14 paintings, they are, by the, by the painter himself, who is not a believer, but they are individually entitled to correspond to the passions of Christ. And in their radically minimalist manner, these raw, unprimed canvases, they do, if we give them a chance, Give each of them a stopping point. That's what a station is, isn't it? Station one, station two. If we slow down as we need to, and we spend time in front of these pieces, indeed we are confronted with a rawness, with a bleeding of paint into, into unprimed canvas, as, of, as others of us who are painters know what that's like, into a lot of let's call it void, emptiness, and irresolution. We're called into this in a manner that becomes religious. 
And this is what fascinated me to have this opportunity, and I can't thank, again, Fourth Presbyterian enough, Walter Hansen, Cam Anderson, for allowing some of us to come with a deep theological, theological curiosity to art, to have this opportunity. But again, in closing, I can't tell you how rich an experience it's been as one who, I love America, I love my country, I love the freedom we have to protest, wear a mask or not. I love the fact that this chapter came full circle back to inviting me and you to remember that we, the people, have a people's gallery, the National Gallery of Art. Not to take from our locale, today our interest is in the Institute down Michigan Avenue. But we are people who have a national gallery, and our national gallery, in my opinion, please go read my chapter. You know a little bit more of what I'm talking about. Please read my chapter, but in my opinion, the reinstallation of Barnett Newman's Stations of the Cross recently, that is in 2016, 2016, is yet another way in which our national gallery is becoming a place of, of invitation to pilgrimage, lament, hope, a great deal of contemplation. David, David, by the way, was um, Walter and I got to co-edit, but he was the editor that we bowed down to all the way along. <laughs> and uh, he's at university, IDB academic, has put together a marvelous uh, whole series that this book belongs to. So David, you might, you're probably going to say a bit about that, but probably talk about Andy Warhol too, so thank you. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Walter, and uh, thank you, Fourth Presbyterian Church. Um, I had the um, the blessing and opportunity to wear multiple hats when I came to this particular project. As Cam just mentioned, uh, I did serve as the in-house editor at University Press, and I was also uh, kindly, you know, um, I was really appreciative of them asking me as somebody who has studied and teaches in theology and the arts to contribute a chapter to that. So uh, it's nice to be back at Fourth Press again. Uh, when Cam and Walter uh, first uh, approached me about this idea, I could not have been more excited. Uh, I am always interested in uh, bringing uh, people together, uh, kind of um, uh, creating conversations, and uh, that's something that we, uh, as a Christian publisher at IVP, um, try to do and have been doing since 1947. So um, for me to, to have a chance to work with them and to come alongside theologians, art historians, practitioners, to reflect a little bit upon some of the theological significance of works at the Art Institute and other locations uh, was really a pleasure. I can't mention very briefly the um, series that this is a part of. Uh, it's one of now eight, soon to be ten volumes in our Studies in Theology and the Art series, uh, which I um, have the pleasure of overseeing. So uh, please do check that out. There are other volumes uh, in the series. None quite like this. Uh, none quite like this. So. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say, as others have uh, mentioned already, that the modern wing is a challenging space. It is not an easy place to go to. Uh, if you are paying attention, if you are listening, if you are looking, uh, it will press you, it will challenge you, it will confront you. Um, and so I, I was, I think, both uh, really pleased and also a little curious to see kind of what would develop out of this uh, project. My own um, work centered on uh, Warhol, um, but I thought I might uh, just begin with a few comments uh, about a different part uh, of the museum. You know, uh, Cam asked us to reflect upon the ways that our thinking has developed. And I think that part of my uh, thinking has developed, well, well, how might some of the things that we perceive in the modern wing, some of the challenges that art presents us with and that we might bring to the standard narrative about art, how might that translate to other ways? What does that look like when we turn the corner? I love the modern way. What happens when we turn the corner uh, and go to, say, the Impressionism way, or we go to the medieval way? Um, I've mentioned already you know, that the modern art can confront, can subvert, can challenge. I think that's true in any one of these spaces. So is this simply an example of 
uh, you know, Van Gogh's uh, interest in the common, in the mundane, in shoes and peasant faces and laborers in the field? Or is this saying something else? The artist represented in the modern wing, um, I think it's, again, very to say, have a often contentious uh, or ambiguous relationship with the church and with the Christian faith. And I think we see that represented in a lot of places within the museum. So um, is, this, is this just a sower? Is this a reflection of the parable of the sower? Is that just the sun? Is that a reference to the sun? Um, for me, I think the things that I, again, as the editor of the project, I had a chance to engage with all of the authors and artists, had a chance to see all the ways that they were kind of um, subverting the narratives of art and allowing ourselves to be challenged by art, and uh, made me think about other places within the museum. The work that I focused on in my chapter was uh, about Andy Warhol. Uh, you will not find this particular image uh, in the Institute, but I, I draw it to your attention because I think it so helpfully and well represents um, what I was reflecting upon. Um, you may know uh, something about, if you know something about aesthetic theory, you may be familiar with the names of Monroe and Beardsley, or if you know something about C.S. Lewis, you might be familiar with his idea of the personal heresy. Uh, both of those ideas, in different ways, uh, say that basically the artist and their background and their story, their personal history, doesn't matter that we can come to know the artwork apart from that. Indeed, we should know it apart from the artist. I'm not a big fan of that idea. Certainly there are challenges. We don't always know who artists are, especially throughout art history. But if I want to know something about Joel's work, if I want to know something about Tim's work or Leah's work, I think it's helpful to know something about that. And so part of my um, project here, sort of my intention in the chapter was to get to know a little bit about um, some of the unknown aspects of Warhol's own life, his relationship to the church, and the ways that actually I think that can kind of subvert our expectations. He's known, of course, for you know being famous, for seeking fame, for having a kind of explicitly commercial uh, appeal and attention, having a kind of you know limited significance, you know, kind of substance. Well, actually, I think that uh, he's incredibly significant, and I think that his own relationship to the church, the, his own version of his faith uh, can inform our reading of his art. I also think that he uh, subverts some of our own expectations. Here we see um, uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, it's called Gold Marilyn Monroe, a uh, quite literal uh, icon. Uh, and I argue that actually what he's doing is showing us the things that we already worship, the things that we already value within our culture. Of course, his work stands within the long tradition of iconography, um, but my suggestion is that actually, uh, just as he was informed by art very early on in the Byzantine Catholic Church that he grew up and he saw the iconostasis uh, every week, um, that he actually can challenge some of our understandings of our own culture, the things that we value, the things that we worship. So uh, you wouldn't think of Warhol necessarily uh, as a religious iconographer, although late in his career he did take up subjects like the Last Supper. Um, but rather, I, I think actually uh, with works like this, he can um, challenge some of our conceptions of what it means uh, to engage with the art as Christian. So is, this, is, is there any kind of explicitly Christian imagery here, much like Linda was just talking about um, with the Stations of the Cross? Uh, well, no and yes. I think that there's uh, ways that uh, Warhol and other artists within the modern wing can challenge our uh, perceptions, and hopefully we have an opportunity to uh, engage with those and, in fact, see uh, present places that we might find surprising. So, you know, uh, just that, that's my personal contribution to the book. But um, you know, from the publisher's perspective, it's just an absolute pleasure to to join with um, all of these contributors, others who are not here today, and to come alongside. Uh, the church here at Fourth Press. Uh, you know, I like to think about my work as an editor as serving both the church and the academy, uh, and this is just a, a fantastic um, example of that. So thank you especially to Cam and Walter uh, for all of your hard work and for making my job uh, mostly easy. We'll go with that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you've been to the events before and listened to artists speak, uh, you, you probably, you, you'll realize that actually we're experiencing a miracle here because we're going to end on time. <laughs> I 
appreciate you all being so succinct um, and just giving us a fresh view of what you're thinking about uh, right now. Um, originally, Walter was going to write the afterword to the book. I was going to write the introduction, do my chapter on um, Giacometti and Brancusi, and then he was going to write the afterword. And one day, I, it was probably a text message, I'm not sure. We talk often, a lot of formats, don't we, Walter? But he said, I, I think you need to do the afterword. I don't think I should do it. And I thought, oh, that's a lot of work. And um, I said, uh, well, let me actually pray about this because I don't, I wasn't even thinking about doing that. I was sort of thinking you would do that. Let me see if you know, some idea comes up. And immediately an idea came to me and I realized I needed to write the chapter. And that's because uh, Walter and I, and we would often, if probably a couple times a year, I would come down and we'd have lunch together in the modern wing and go to the galleries. And one day we saw this piece together that has its own room a piece called Hinoki by Charles Ray, which uh, he produced in 2007, and it took my breath away. Um, and then we, and we also began to joke about this, and so in text, Walter would start uh, calling me, uh, my nickname, my Walter nickname is Old Dog, okay? <laughs> and, and, but it just became a point of reference between us, and I knew that I wanted to write about this piece. Um, so I'm actually going to read a little bit out of my, my chapter in, in this book. Um, first of all, this is a quote by the artist uh, Charles Ray. He said, Ten years ago, while driving up the central coast of California, I spotted a fallen tree in a meadow just off the highway. I was instantly drawn to it. It was not only a beautiful log, but to my eyes, it was perfectly embedded in the meadow where it had fallen decades earlier. Pressure from weather, insects, ultraviolet radiation, and gravity were evident. Total collapse appeared to be no more than a handful of years away. I was inspired to make a sculpture and study many other logs, but I realized that I was only interested in this particular one. And I won't tell the longish story, but he thought about different ways. I thought about making a, a inflatable plastic version of this log and all kinds of zany, kinds of crazy stuff. But what he realized is he couldn't get this picture of this fallen redwood out of his mind. It was such to him such a lovely, elegant thing, even as it was in its last lap of life, really about to completely uh, really just come, come apart and, and become part of the earth again. And so what, what he did is um, he did end up making a mold of this in, in fiberglass, and he sent it um, to a skilled craftsman in Japan, who typically he and his team rebuild um, chapels and Buddhas, temples and Buddhas in Japan. They rebuild them. They um, recover them when they're near collapse and they give them kind of new life. And I write in here about the resurrection kind of image that comes up in here. And so he had uh, over four years and at a considerable expense, he had this piece made by hand out of cypress wood um, just to get a sense for its beauty that's the hand carving close up it's just an absolutely gorgeous object so here's a couple paragraphs that i wrote near the end of this chapter about this log the meadow where ray first noticed the fallen redwood was located some 150 miles from his home Yet he made regular visits to see it. Somehow that gnarled yet graceful carcass remained present to him. It beckoned. Like all things we love, the fallen tree had cultivated Ray's affection. There was, for Charles Ray, something resonant in the body of this tree that needed to be studied and beheld. 
The material beauty of Reed's transformational project leads to a substantial, substantially larger conviction. In the moral and spiritual universe that most of us hope to inhabit, everything matters. Every object, face, body, and soul is graced with significance. In this economy of significance, the demise of a majestic tree becomes the object of an artist's contemplation. Religious minds recognize that as the inherent goodness of creation, I'm sorry, let me reread that. Religious minds recognize this as the inherent goodness of creation, the holiness of the world. Once grounded, a felled or fallen tree will succumb to degradation. Subservient to time and gravity, it will enter the second half of its being. Facsimile of the redwood that Ray commissioned, Yaboki Mukuyoki, um, Mukuyoshi, to produce, is no exception. The craftsman estimated that his cypress tree sculpture would remain stable for 400 years. It began to crack and check after the next 200, and in the final 400, decompose. Will the Art Institute of Chicago and its venerable collection still be standing in a thousand years? If so, in what form? So the facsimile was going to have a thousand year lifespan. Astonishing. Here's the last paragraph. When caught up in the luxury of Monet's scumble paint, my introduction I wrote about Monet. Scumble paint are drawn into the mystery of a Rothko canvas. A kind of longing is stirred. In that moment, those of us trained in these matters are encouraged to remain disinterested to maintain a critical distance. We dare not name the longing. A wash from the ironic, the embrace of sincerity appears naive. In the end, this posture will not do. Most of us believe, or at least hope, for some kind of transcendental reality. Ah, the thought of new bodies. Renewed minds and restored relationships. The whole universe made right. That thought to me, now, or new creation, is sweet as nectar. So that's the end of the book. Walter. Hey, go, Leah. <laughs> Leah introduced us to uh, artist Andre Kader. Is that right? Kader. Kader. Andre Kader. From Poland, traveling through the streets of Europe, he would carry these folds that he made of different colors. And uninvited, unwelcomed, he placed a pole into a gallery. Leaned <laughs> against the wall, put it on the windows. <clears throat> this is quite upsetting. You have to be invited. You have to have a reputation. People have to know who you are. He persisted. He walked through the streets. He would be public outside art. He would be seen, photographed. And he'd walk into a museum and places pole in a corner. He wasn't invited. He wasn't welcome. He was a protest outside, like we were hearing today. He was out there, but he dared to come in here and be disruptive. They gave a long talk at our previous book launch in Madison. I wish we had time for that here. But thank you for introducing us to this disruptive artist. And <clears throat> I have fun finding that Andre Paul wherever I go. <laughs> so I, I can't remember why he found this. <laughs> and they're hard to find. He made 180 of these. And uh, we had have one at the Modern Wing. And uh, it's been on display once in a while, but not too often. It's been too disruptive. <laughs> Now I come full circle to uh, what I said at the beginning. I found 
Shannon's message is going to be very disruptive, shattering. Repent. Are you kidding me? Turn it up. Having a different frame of mind. At the same time, it was transformative, restored, life changing. Thank you. Amen.